Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence in worship and adoration and uh, surrender before you. We come uh, as a gathered body to invite you to the center of this service, to the center of our lives. We ask, Father, that you would be honored and lifted up in all that we say and do. And that, Father, as we honor you and worship you, we would encourage each other in our walk and faith. Uphold those who are discouraged. Encourage those, Lord, who are troubled. Humble us in all of our endeavors to know that we need you. So, Lord, we come to you in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, if you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn to the book of Romans, the first chapter, for our scripture reading, verses 7 through um, verse uh, 12. Romans 1, verses 7 through 12 for our scripture reading. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. God, may God encourage his people as we read and meditate on his word. It's good to be with you. I was in uh, the grocery store this week, and uh, somebody from my days at Brush Creek came up to me, and we were talking. He said, you still preach? I said, you know, I'm every chance I get. And uh, so when Pastor uh, Jared called me uh, Friday evening or texted me Friday evening, he said, oh, man, I hate to call you last minute, but uh, I've got COVID. Could you uh, preach for me on Sunday? I would. I, I gave my standard answer to any request to fill the pulpit. Yes! <laughs> Who are you? When is this? But, uh, no, actually, uh, I am teaching Sunday School at Celebration this morning, and uh, so I'm going to have to jet a bit, but your time and the time of Celebration worked out for me to be able to be here and, and be with you. And then uh, we were discussing... Um, uh, what he has been uh, preaching, and I always like in public supply to be able to fit in with what a pastor has been doing. He says, I'm this late, now let's just bring something you have already prepared. Yeah, I just can't do that. <laughs> yeah, I just can't pull something out of the can. Now, my father-in-law, Vern Schutz, always could, man. He had, if I was a little sick and uh, talked to him on Saturday, he said, you know, he says, I've got a sermon all ready to go. I wasn't so sure I wanted him praying for me. Uh, and he would come sometimes on a Sunday morning and say, you know, if you can't make it, i got a message, right? Anyway. But um, I, uh, I said to, um, to Pastor Jared, I'd, I'd like to do something that fits with what you've been doing in the book of Acts. And um, he shared with me the text he was in last week, and uh, it, it drew me to... Uh, to the question and to the discussion that we find in the book of Romans that is so um, important for us. Isn't it true that God's plans are always best? Amen. Yep. Can't understand them sometimes, but as we look in the rear view mirror, we see his hand, we see his fingerprint, we see his heart of love, and we see his wisdom in all that he does. Uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward, uh, I guess, to celebrating my 70th birthday next month. And uh, I was 23 when I started at uh, Grace Community, where Abby Pickett was at the time. It's been uh, a, a long but very quick journey to this point in my life. 
And uh, one of the things that has been really impressed on me is God's wisdom in working and moving in, uh, in my life. Um, I, um, I dated three girls in uh, church uh, before um, I found uh, Sherry. And, uh, you know, uh, all three of those girls, I thought, yeah, they're the one, they're the one, they're the one. Uh, no, <laughs> God had the one. And um, I, I guess uh, the, the way that I found out that she was uh, the one was interesting because I asked her out on a date and uh, she answered me quickly, no. How come? Yeah, I was so bold that I just, I said, how come? She said, well, you were dating my friend and broke up with her and she's hurting and she's my friend. Who? I said to myself, this girl is loyal and I will find a way to get a date with her. So I, 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 beat it down the road to my previous girlfriend and explain myself a little bit better and apologize for hurting her. Turned right around and went back and asked Sherry out again. And in the meantime, she had gone to our youth director, Dick Walker, and said, you know, Gary asked me out and I, uh, I turned him down, but I think he's going to ask me again. And uh, she explained the whole situation. And Dick said, well, how long do you want to date him? I said, well, I think so. She said, well, how long are you going to wait? And uh, your friend is not going to be over this in 20 minutes. So he had talked with her. And uh, I came back and, and asked her out uh, again. And she said, yes. And uh, I'm, I'm glad she didn't say no again because uh, I probably wouldn't have asked a third time. <laughs> uh, and uh, our first date was February 14 uh, for her 18th birthday. And um, the Lord wrote the rest of that story. We've been married now 51 years this past December. And uh, I, I, I love her probably more than ever because she is so loyal and God is so good. And then I experienced uh, God's uh, goodness and his plans in contrast to mine in that uh, I served um, three churches as full-time uh, pastor. Uh, the first one was Grace Community Church in Belmont. And uh, when I graduated from uh, Grace Bible College, I really felt like the Lord was, was directing me towards full-time youth ministry. And there was a church in Grants Pass, Oregon, that was looking for a youth pastor. And I thought, I'd been part-time at, at the Berea, now Rush Creek. And uh, they weren't ready. They didn't have the money, whatever, uh, to hire a full-time youth pastor. But there was this, this opening in Grants Pass, Oregon. And that's kind of where my heart was drawn. And the church, they called Charlie Young, and not me. And uh, sent me to Grace Community Church. At the time, they'd been kind of discouraged. And um, we had nine years, a little more than nine years of ministry in their midst. And uh, some of those folks, like Abby, are still dear friends, and uh, so thankful for my time there. And then um, I, I left that ministry and took six months to frame homes. And it was a good time working with um, hammer, nail, and air guns. And, you know, I made all of seven bucks an hour. And took care of my own expenses, my own travel. And I thought, Lord, what are you doing? seven dollars an hour and I had three kids I said okay you know whatever and so for six months I framed homes didn't understand what all God was doing but uh, you know what was interesting is that what I learned framing homes 
Though I only made seven dollars an hour, it has brought me, by the grace and kindness of God, tens of thousands of dollars in real estate. In reality, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because I learned something in a time where I needed to do something different. I learned skills and abilities that God used to bless my family and those coming behind me in a wonderful way, even though I didn't understand and I was hurting. God had his way. And then we went to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I thought God was going to send me to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. You know, I'm a hunter and it just made sense. God would send me to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I could preach and love people and hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt. God sent me to Phoenix, Arizona. I remember saying to Chuck O'Connor, said, Chuck, what do people do there for recreation? He says, they go to the desert. <laughs> what? Um, God didn't send me to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He sent me to Phoenix, Arizona. And we had nine and a half years of blessed ministry and saw a, a church turn around and, and move in a positive direction and still continues today in a positive direction. And then, <clears throat> back in um, our old home church of Berean Bible Church, they went through a split. 1993. It was a mess. I remember my wife calling up her dad and saying, Dad, if they ask you to come and, and be interim pastor, I love you. Tell them no. <laughs> Some of you who know my wife would know that that's not the kind of boldness that she's noted for. And she said, if they ask you to come back and be pastor again, I love you. Tell them no. And uh, then I got a phone call from Berean and said, hey, uh, we're wondering if you would uh, come and uh, just fill the pulpit for us. And I said, just filling the pulpit, right? Just preaching for a Sunday, right? He said, yeah. He says, now our pulpit is open, but we're just asking you to come and, and preach for us on a Sunday and also preach at um, um, what is now Frontline Church in the evening. Both churches are open and we're kind of working together for pulpit supply. Would you come? I said, uh, well, my family's there and um, yeah, I, uh, I'll, let me ask my board. And I uh, talked with the board and I said, hey, uh, would it be okay if, uh, if I flew to Michigan and preached at these two churches that are looking for pulpit supply? I said, I know they're open. All they're asking me for is pulpit supply. And the board said, sure, you can go. We know you'll never go there. And it was the truth, you know. It was the last place I wanted to go, to a church that had split, a church that I knew pretty well. I knew their positives, and man, I knew their negatives. It was like, nah. Well, God turned my heart around turn my wife's heart around and directed us uh, to go there. We had uh, 18 years with Berea and now Rush Creek. And God in his sovereignty um, was, was kind to bless that ministry in, in wonderful ways. And it was our most uh, productive and positive of our of our three ministries and um, so thankful for what uh, what God has done uh, taught me some important lessons we do not understand his ways but we can trust his heart and we can trust that he's always at work to do things that are remarkable now in Romans we see that in the life of the Apostle Paul and I want you to go back there with me as we spent some time looking at what God did with the Apostle Paul and uh, his relationship with the church at Rome. We have to remember 
that Paul had never been to Rome. He did not establish the church at Rome. The church at Rome was probably founded by Jewish pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost and heard the message of the 12 apostles preaching about Jesus. And they gave their life to Christ and went back to Rome. Uh, they're listed among the pilgrims that were uh, at uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and 1. And um, it was those people who probably founded the church at uh, Rome. And uh, Paul uh, uh, had not been, if you will, their founder, their pastor, their teacher. Um, Though he knew people who were there, who he had encountered in other places, it was a church at a distance from him. And yet we see in the sovereignty of God that Paul had a dear heart for these people. Verse 9 says this, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul was praying for people who were at a distance from himself. You know, um, he hadn't been there in the sovereignty of God, and yet he had a heart for those people. And, I, and I, it speaks to me about the reality that the whole body of Christ ought to have a heart for the whole body of Christ. Um, your church is one of the smaller churches in this area. So is Celebration Bible Church. Frontline and Rush Creek are a little bit uh, a little bit bigger, but we all have to, ought to have a heart of prayer for each other. In the sovereignty of God, uh, we need to have the heart of God for congregations and for people that are at some distance from ourselves. And I think that that also extends to the whole reality of of, of the church and other nations. And uh, what they're about, you know, one of the things in my uh, few travels to uh, other countries and to observe and be involved in, in foreign missions, it was always very important for the national church to receive the greetings and the prayers of uh, the church in the states. And for me to take the greetings of the church there in other countries back to the states and to the brothers here. because. There is this connection, and that's part of God's plan and part of God's uh, purpose, even when we are at some distance from one another. And Paul had a plan, too, to come to Rome. Look at verse 10. He says, I'm making request if by some means. He had no idea of the means that God was going to use to get into Rome. But he says, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. Paul's um, purposes and plans were to give. You know, um, that, that speaks to us about our plans and God's plans, it needs to have the right focus. You've come to church today. Bless you for coming. It'd be real tough to be invited to be the pulpit supply and everybody hear about it and decide to stay away. All right? But you came. Did you come to receive or to give? Did I come? To receive or to give. I want to tell you something. In the heart of God and the plans of God, the people of God need to come alongside of his purposes that it's in giving. That we find our plans to be best. Paul wanted to come to them so that he could impart to them some spiritual gift. And what's interesting is that that becomes a mutual thing. Verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. When our focus starts with giving, it's interesting 
that it goes both ways. If our focus is in getting, generally we are disappointed and other people are not blessed. Look with me at verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned, planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Paul tells us here in this text that he had planned to go there. Um, I, I want to say to us, in life, and in ministry, whatever our age, whatever the size of our ministry, we ought to have plans. <coughs> we ought to have plans that are running through our minds and hearts of what God will do. You know, someone has said, if you don't have a plan, you plan to fail. Paul said, I, I plan to come to you. He says, I was hindered in a variety of ways. But I'm hoping to come at last so that I can have some fruit among you, particularly thinking of the Gentile people in the church, as well as the ministry that he had in Gentiles in the greater world. Now, the church in Jerusalem was that true blend and mix of people whose background were Jewish and people whose background was Greek, Roman, slaves from all parts of the world had come to faith in Jesus Christ in the Church of Rome. It was truly, if you will, a diverse congregation. And Paul said, man, I want to go there. And he said, I, I know that in going there, God will do some things in the church that will, that will resonate throughout time and in, in eternity because it is that mixed church. It is the center of the world. It is that place where people are always coming and going through. And, and I want to go there. He had a plan. Uh, do you have a plan for yourself? What God might do with you? It's interesting, um, as I come to this time in my life, that I, I really need to work at having a plan. This is the third time I've retired. <laughs> what is my plan? I'm working on it. <laughs> I need to work on it. Because if you don't have a plan for God to do something significant with you, life and its purpose shrinks. You have friends, if you have family, if you have grandchildren, great-grandchildren, if you have people who are young leaders that you can have influence and encouragement on, be planning. God will direct, but be planning to be a blessing. You know, uh, quite frankly, one of my purposes and plans at this point in my life is to encourage every young pastor I can get a hold of. Just encourage them. Man, do we need them. We really do. God bless Pastor Jerry. You have a great opportunity to encourage this young guy. And one of the reasons I was looking forward to coming today was that Abby Pickett told me what a good preacher Jared is. That encouraged me to be an encouragement to him. And we'll be together again. I think it's the 23rd of February that the pastor's group gets together. And golly, I think we've got like 15, 20 guys that get together and just encourage each other. And and it's, it's wonderful to have the freedom and the time to be able to just invest in those young guys. And then uh, my, my granddaughter, Olivia, is dating an excellent young man who's heading for the pastorate and um, his name is John Michael Clark and what what a joy it is to just 
encourage him and remind him that I hold his life in my hand. Because he's dating my granddaughter. <laughs> I said to him one time, I said, you know, you have a wonderful reputation and I've heard you speak. I heard him speak at the graduation of GCU um, spring of 2022 and I was impressed. I said, I, I was really impressed that you're an excellent young man. I just didn't know that you were so excellent that you would have the opportunity to date my granddaughter. <laughs> Great guy. Do you have a plan? Look down at verse 15. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, in all of our planning, Paul shows us the centrality of the gospel must always be there. Always, always be there. You cannot move too far for the centrality of the love of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and that we need him. Um, I've had uh, some interesting experiences just recently with remembering the importance of the centrality of the gospel. A little over a year ago, I had a friend uh, call me up who had been part of Rush Creek and uh, involved there. And um, then he dropped out and he called me and his life was a mess. And we got together and we talked and he shared and I sat with him and I asked him, you know, with what you're saying to me, I wonder whether or not you are redeemed. And I need to ask you, have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? as a sinner coming to him, asking him to be your savior and giving yourself over to him. And he said, no. Now he'd said all the right things and had been involved in evangelism ministry at the church, but he had never given his life to Christ. And you know what? That day was the first time I asked him the question directly. And I said, I'll never do that again. And I said, you know what? If we have not given our life to Jesus Christ, we do not have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And if the Holy Spirit is not inside of us, we do not have the power of victory over those things that would destroy us. He gave his life to Christ, and it's made all the difference. And just in the last week, I sat with a young Young, well, you know, it's all relative nowadays. And he said, you know what? He said, I regret that I did not give my kids that core, that center of the gospel and of Jesus Christ that I had as a child. He said, I've let distractions and problems pull me away from church, pull me away from really discipling my kids in the faith. And he said, uh, I've got to do something about it. And I was with his family in a larger group and, and I just sensed that his kids were ready to give their life to Christ. And I told him so. And we sat down and went over the Romans road. And I said, you know what? You're the one 
that means to speak to your children and invite them <coughs> to a relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, well, shouldn't I get them going to church first? I said, you know what? This is the starting point. And I said, unfortunately, and even great churches, there are all kinds of, there's a piece here and there's a piece there and there's a piece over here and a piece over here, but there's not that holistic foundation centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to start with your kids and their need of Jesus. And you can be the one to ask the question and to commit to discipling them in faith. And I gave him what I felt was probably the best resource for him to use in that. God had a plan, and that plan centered around the gospel. Well, <clears throat> take your uh, Bible again and go over to the 15th chapter of Romans, and we'll see more about uh, Paul's plans to come to Rome and God's sovereignty and the things that God taught him. Verse 22. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I will come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me and your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. <laughs> Paul wrote to the Romans as he had basically finished the collection for the saints of Jerusalem and was on his way to Jerusalem to deliver it. He says, after I've dropped it off, he says, I'm coming, I'm going to Spain. He says, I'm going to be coming through you, and I want to visit with you, and you can help me get to Spain. Well, we know he got to Rome, but not the way he expected. <laughs> and you studied that last week. His journey to Rome was filled with all kind of trouble. And yet, did God abandon him? Were his prayers and plans discarded by God? No. Just answered in a different kind of way. If you're going through hard times and there's pain and struggle that you did not plan on, do know that God has not forsaken you. Do know that he's still at work. And do know that he loves you. And that he is preparing and doing things for his glory that are truly good, even when you and I cannot understand Have there been times when you've been angry with God? <coughs> Be 
because though you had good plans and were pursuing those plans with the right heart, either the enemy or, or some of God's people have brought pain. God is not forsaking you. He is there. He is at work. Paul knew how much the uh, lost Jewish leadership hated him. And they hated him because he said, everything that we need is in Christ and in his grace. It is no longer the law. The law has been set aside, and that was, that was something even more extreme than the Christian to Jerusalem had proclaimed, that Jesus is the Messiah. And they saw what he was teaching about Christ and grace as a th very threat to their very existence and their national identity. And they hated Paul. They misunderstood him in some aspects. But they hated him. And Paul says, I'm going to Judea. I'm going to Jerusalem. You pray for me. You pray for me that the leadership at Judea and Jerusalem will not have their way. I wonder how Paul felt when they were ready to kill him outside of the temple. God, have you answered my prayer? And the prayer of Christians everywhere I've been and places I haven't been like Rome. They want to kill me right here. But in the midst of the mob, God, through a Roman um, military person, gave Paul the opportunity to preach the gospel clearly right outside the temple. And then, uh, you know, the Jews <clears throat> had a plot to, to kill him on the road between Jerusalem and Caesarea. And they took a vow to not eat until they killed Paul. And God intervened and protected him. From the outside, it would seem like the people at Judea who hated Paul had their way, but no. God's hand set the shield and the limits beyond which they could not go. Because God told Paul, you got to go to Jerusalem and you'll get there. And he stood by him and comforted him. Paul's plan and prayer was some, for something pretty peaceful. Didn't turn, quite out, turn out quite that way. But God, in his sovereignty, had a great and glorious plan. One last thought about God's great and glorious plan. You know, um, Romans is the first Pauline epistle as we find it in our Bible. Why is it the first one? It was not a church that he had been to. Well, there are two basic reasons. The one is simple. It's the longest. And that's how they arrange the books in the New Testament Bible. Longest first. And then shortest, shorter following of the church letters. Well, what's interesting and wonderful about the book of Romans and the sovereignty of God and the planning of God and all that he did with Paul in the book of Acts and that we read about is that by writing to a church that he had not been to, he wasn't writing about a couple of key problems like he did with Corinth, Galatia, Colossians. First and Second Thessalonians. He was always dealing with 
a problem that needed a theological and practical approach from God. And that's why we have, if you will, this great foundational theological epistle. Because Paul was at a distance from the church at Rome, God directed him to write the undergirding theology for the church. Everything from creation to sin to redemption to victory to ministry to future hope is here in this book because God had a plan. And he had a person. And he worked in a powerful, powerful way. Though he was shipwrecked, <laughs> though he suffered greatly, God had a purpose and a plan. And Paul surrendered to that purpose and plan, even though it was a bit different from his own. And God encourage you and your congregation as you live and serve on purpose for him. God will direct. God will use as only he can. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and true and good and wise, full of love. And we say yes, Lord, to what you have for us, for your glory. We ask for your encouragement. We ask for a peace that passes understanding. We ask for courage that comes from the mighty Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.